So a quick introduction uh, on Brad. Brad is uh, a co-founder and CEO of SignalPath uh, Research, a company leveraging technology to make clinical trials more efficient and effective. He's also a medical oncologist, so a physician, a principal investigator and senior advisor to Highland Partners, a private equity uh, fund based in Dallas. Prior to his uh, role here, he held a leadership role, uh, well, several leadership roles, but one at uh, Flatiron Health, which was a Google-backed data analytics company sold to Roche for a couple billion dollars two years ago. And he also held leadership roles at Duke University. Across all his roles, uh, he has focused on the use of data and novel technologies to advance the frontiers in medicine. Um, what you should also know, he's a very generous individual, not just with his time, any way that he can help uh, people that are interested in health innovation. He's shown um, me many, many times uh, that he's willing to do that. And so not just a very, very smart person, but also very generous, both with his time and his talent. So with that, I'm going to unshare and let you, Brad, uh, take over. Perfect. Uh, thanks for the, the kind words, Hubert. And obviously, I think incredibly highly of the work that you do at Health Wildcatters as well as, as hackathons like this. Uh, you know, I, I've, I've been, uh, I was first introduced to hackathons back at Flatiron where uh, companies were formed, where ASCO plenaries were, were, came up with during hackathons. And so I've definitely seen the utility of them over time and, and the power they can have. So excited to be a part of what's happening. Uh, and so what I was tasked with today, which I'm excited about, is talk a little bit about my COVID, ex uh, not my personal COVID experience, I haven't had COVID, but the experience over the past year uh, as a clinician, as someone who has actually been a clinical, clinical trial participant, I was actually on the Pfizer vaccine trial, um, and as somebody leading a technology company in the clinical research space, I would argue it has been uh, as interesting a year in the clinical research space as I will have ever seen or will ever see. So I, I guess I'd start with my practice. So uh, SignalPath had really started gaining steam over the last couple of years. And a year ago, I stepped down as an oncologist. I was part of a group in, in, in town here called Texas Oncology. And I, I had a good practice and I loved it. But like many clinicians, if you co-found one of these companies or you help to raise money for them, as they gain steam, often you lose the ability to practice. My mentor at Duke, that happened to. And uh, about a year ago, my board and my leadership basically said, uh, either you need to let somebody else be the CEO of this thing or you need to step away from your practice and be full time. And that happened literally a week before COVID became a thing. And then two weeks later, a number of uh, the docs in my practice were a bit older and, and uh, they were very afraid, their, their families were very afraid about the risk to them as we were figuring out what was happening with COVID in the, in the early days of it. And I was asked to go back. And so I remember I have a four-year-old and a seven-year-old and the wife at home. And I remember sort of the, the stress of of, of driving in the first time and the uncertainty around what did it mean as a clinician. I had talked to one of the docs in our practice uh, about his experience with AIDS in the 80s uh, and, and walking in and having really no idea what to expect and why, why were things happening? How do you protect yourself? What does it mean? And, and it really brought home the importance of clinical research and how we, we drive discovery in medicine. Uh, I knew that we had to get quick answers and that unfortunately the US was not gonna be prepared to get quick answers because of how we thought about things for a long time. Uh, and that really hit home as I was coming in. You know, when I when I would go home from from the hospital, I would go to my parents' house who were out of town. I would shower and I would clean everything and I would leave things in corners and, you know, really fearful about what it all meant with no real idea um, of of how to how to drive things. But it gave me an entirely new perspective on the importance of having really quick answers in medicine and how do we get there. And if you think back a year ago. We didn't know the role of hydroxychloroquine. You know, there were people people saying that it was gonna that it was our savior, but a lot of us who had seen different things didn't believe that to be the case. Azithromycin, convalescent plasma, remdesivir. There were just so many questions out there, and a lot of us were sort of faced with how do we get quick answers? And it wasn't just about medicines; it was diagnostics. What were the role of different types of diagnostic tests, different interventions? Did masks work? Did they not work? And I would argue that I'll talk about this over the next 15 minutes or so, but I would also argue that it's still a problem. So I still get calls as a clinician, uh, you know, does ivermectin work in Bolivia? They're handing out ivermectin. Should my dad take it? And it's hard to pre prove a negative, right? It's hard to say whether or not things work when there isn't research showing whether it did or not. But during the early days, I figured first I should take part in, in driving discovery. Uh, I've, been, I've been putting people on trials for many years. I've been running a trial or a company related to clinical trials. 
at Flatiron, our goal was to aggregate data and drive new discovery. And so I saw the vaccines as an opportunity to, to participate on my own and, and, and drive things forward. I deeply believed in the science. For folks that haven't watched the science of the mRNA vaccines, it's actually pretty fascinating. There's a, there's a great podcast that uh, A16Z, the Andreessen Horowitz folks put on, their, their bio partner, Jorge, put on uh, a podcast with the CEO of Moderna. And for anybody that wants to understand how we got an MRA vaccine as quickly as we did, it's a fascinating balance um, of, of not being too technical, but getting to the weeds of, of how that happened and how it wasn't chance that they were ready to go when the time hit and that they'd been working with Fauci's uh, group for a number of years and really been prepared to, to kick things off. And so I had, uh, I had a great deal of faith and interest in the science underlying it. I had uh, a belief that there was a public good and I also wanted to see what it was like to be a trialist on the other side. And so I signed up for the Moderna or the Pfizer trial at the time. Uh, showed up at a clinic here in town. It was, an, it was an infectious disease clinic that went from putting a couple of patients on trial in a given year to putting 500 on in two months. Uh, and to say that the folks that were overtaxed, I think, would be the, the understatement of the year. I mean, incredible people doing incredible work, doing everything they could to advance the science, uh, but, but um, working incredibly hard. And the, the actual experience of being on a clinical trial should have taken me about 30 minutes. I, should, I needed to be consented. I needed to have an exam done. They needed to swab me, give me an injection, and send me home. Should have been a 20 minute. I was there for five and a half hours for my first visit. Uh, I saw seven different people beyond, and I didn't see a doc at any point, but I saw seven different people uh, during the course of my five plus hours in the clinic that day. Uh, there were a whole bunch of technology products that were presented to me, none of which were coordinated across. Uh, much of it could have been done online. They could have recruited me. I got a random call. I had, I had asked to be enrolled four months prior, got a random call that I needed to be there that week. Uh, they walked me through a paper consent process. They enrolled me, you know, three different apps, one to get paid. They didn't even tell me I was getting paid to participate. And I was making $200 every time I went to clinic. Uh, I had to fill out patient surveys. It was a different app that was not user, the user experience was not ideal to say the least. There were just a lot of limitations of my experience. And so it reinforced the fact that clinical research is fundamentally broken still as a participant on a trial. We do it because either we need access to a life-saving drug, we believe we can advance the science, it's part of the public good. But despite years of trying to get answers there, it reinforced the limitations that still exist. And for me, it got even worse. Uh, so I got the first Pfizer vaccine. One of the exclusion criteria for the trial was that you couldn't get the flu shot. Uh, for two weeks before, two weeks after. I didn't have any warning I was gonna go on the trial, didn't get my flu shot in time. And I think I'm the only person in the country got the flu this year. So not only did I get the flu for the first time in my adult life, but I got super sick and went to the ER twice. I went to the UT Southwestern ER at one point because uh, I felt so bad. Everybody kept telling me I had COVID. I think I had seven COVID tests in the course of a week. But to complicate it more, uh, I tried to get answers on the trial of you know, can I take what, you know, what flu, what, what can I take to treat the flu? Am I allowed Tamiflu? Is that an exclusion? Am I going to cause a deviation? I didn't want to mess up their trial. You know, they wanted to give me steroids. I knew I couldn't get steroids. I couldn't get anybody on the phone to answer the questions. The people that I did couldn't get the answers to the questions. So once again, reinforcing the fact that while I've spent a lot, a lot of time thinking about these things, we, we, we haven't answered them yet. And then the other thing, I'll actually share a couple of slides. So my personal experience of the trials was broken. You know, hackathons are great ways to start thinking out solutions to these types of problems. But I would also argue that our approach in the US, uh, as compared to places like the UK, were also uh, unfortunately pretty broken. Um, and these are a couple slides, and I took some of them from there's a great city is the Clinical Trials Transformation Initiative. It's a group out of Duke. And they, they have a series of webinars and this one they put on in, uh, in January. And I took a couple of slides from it about the issue. So you would think that, uh, so there are problems at the site level of the conduct of trials, but you would think that we would have a well-coordinated infrastructure to drive discovery um, about, about COVID in the country, right? You would think that there's this coordinating group that would come out there and say, we need these 10 trials and let's get patients on them across all these sites. But what we saw is, if you go to clinicaltrials.gov, which again is the, the tool where everybody uploads the trials that they're doing so you can search across them, there's actually a specific area to look at COVID trials. And what we saw is there was a huge uptick in trials in the February to April timeframe. Uh, the red line are trials that had no external funding, meaning they're investigator initiated trials, meaning you know a doc in an academic center or something like that had an idea and wanted to drive a trial. 
the black line are industry trials, pharma trials. So, you know, a whole bunch of pharmaceutical clients started trying to put on put their own trials in place to test their agents to see if they worked. And there was a small, much smaller number of NIH sponsored trials and other types of trials, but there was this huge input or this huge increase of, of folks that were trying to get answers, right? These are clinicians, these are academics that really want to drive discovery. You know, part of it is personal glory, I'm sure, but I, I think I have to believe it is the greater good of trying to get answers of, of, of huge problems that are facing us all. But that lack of coordination is a huge issue. So there were 4,000 trials that were registered to look at COVID uh, prior to December of last year. 600 of those were in the, or 558 were in the US driving treatment or looking at new treatments. And you would argue, there's no way you can argue that there were 558 unique, interesting therapeutic options for COVID that were sitting on a shelf waiting to go, right? There are 10 or 20 that we'll talk about in a second. When you break that down a little further, what you see is that uh, there were 50 trials looking at hydroxychloroquine. Obviously it was the the question of the moment, did it work? Uh, and among those, 31 were not even funded trials by, by government or pharma. They were academics and others that were trying to get answers. Only 22% were multiple, multiple sites, but the median had one site looking at this answer or looking to get that answer. The same with convalescent plasma. Obviously the idea of giving somebody's antibodies to another uh, as a treatment is one that had great promise that a lot of people were excited about. Um, it's largely unfortunately proven untrue, including in the last week or two where even the outpatient convalescent plasma studies have failed uh, or been stopped for futility. Remdesivir and tocilizumab had some promise when they came out. So they definitely show a survival benefit, not of the type that we would have loved to have seen, uh, but even remdesivir. So Gilead opened 19 trials and basically flooded the market with trials, which limited other people's abilities to get trials uh, looking at COVID patients because of the overlap of those trials. So, and one more slide about this would say, uh, what looks at the number of sites that were open related to these trials. So the median number of sites for a trial was one. There are a couple of very large trials that, that drive the mean higher of you know, 10 to 20, um, but you can't answer questions with single site trials with very, and especially when, when you're splitting up your patients at all these different sites across many. And the vast majority of these trials were only in the US. So it's not like we were looking at diverse populations or coordinating worldwide to get answers to a pandemic. Um, so what I would say is that my, my point with all of this piece of it is, uh, even if you get it right, even if you have an efficient trial that's well run and well executed, in the US at least, we didn't really think about how are we gonna get answers to these questions? We really need a coordinated national effort of these are the 10 drugs, every health system in the country needs to be looking at them. We need to put tens of thousands of patients on in a very short time frame, and, and we need that coordinated infrastructure. And I'll walk you through how other folks have done it and how we've started to do it, because it has actually been an incredible wake-up call for the NIH and the FDA at the very senior levels, Operation Warp Speed and others, uh, really about six to nine months into the pandemic started to say, how do we look at research differently? What is the structure of it need to be? As a matter of fact, I, there was an email from somebody yesterday about how Janet Woodcock is now really, who is the acting commissioner of the FDA right now, is incredibly dedicated to what is the clinical trial ecosystem of the future look like? Uh, it's an area where, and I'm biased, I, I run a company looking at these things, right, of clinical research technology. So obviously it's something I spent a lot of my, my, my career thinking about. But as you think about hackathons, as you think about places of innovation, this is a big piece of it. I'll tell you one of the areas that has been very successful and is now getting a lot of attention is to move away from this idea of a clinical trial as it has historically been. One stadium per game, meaning you know, every hospital has one trial that they're doing that's their own trial. You have to spin up costly infrastructure every time you do it. It takes years to complete it. It's a, it's a predetermined order of questions. That's not the way medicine works. It's not the way our trial should work. It's actually a, an incredibly broken model as has been proven during COVID in the US. The way the world is going, and this is something I spend a lot of time thinking about, is this idea of adaptive platform trials. So it's still a randomized trial. I spent a lot of my time at, at Flatiron thinking about real world evidence. How do you use evidence that's generated in, real, in, in routine care uh, to drive discovery and synthetic control arms for trials and all of that. But this is, this is the traditional randomized trial infrastructure, but the idea of adaptive trials, meaning they evolve. You put 10 patients on a drug, if, that's, if it's going well, you increase it to 50 patients. If it's failing, you stop that drug, you put in another drug, right? And so you adapt the trial and it becomes a platform. And this idea of master protocols, which means it's one protocol, it's one infrastructure for a trial, you're not swapping it out all the time. If you really get to that point where we have a, a number of master protocols around the country, 
that allow you the flexibility to test things quickly, get answers quickly, stop it if it's futile really quickly, you can really start to make a difference in how clinical research should be done as opposed to how it has been done. There are other aspects of it that I'll come to in a second. Uh, and there are examples of this. So oncology, I'm an oncologist, so I'm biased, but oncology has done this better than anybody else historically. There are two, two examples I, I show here. One is something called the iSpy trial, which was a, a breast cancer trial. Another one is in, in a brain tumor called glioblastoma, uh, where they've actually put together really sophisticated uh, platform trials and, and done them very well. But uh, the group, so I, I talked about the US's failings, both in my personal trial experience, as well as um, in the way that we just sort of had this craziness of trials that were, that, were, that were growing. The UK actually did the opposite. They did it incredibly well. So this is a, an Economist article from a, a less than a week ago, where the headline is how British science came to the rescue. Elite institutions, streamlined regulation, and big data sets are a part, potent combination. The recovery trial is actually pretty fascinating to watch. So within days of the pandemic becoming uh, very visible, they had spun up much, many of the hospitals in, in the UK were a part of this recovery trial. So it was incredibly streamlined um, uh, consenting of patients that are sick. Uh, it was using the electronic health record to drive answers. It was a single trial infrastructure where they were quickly testing different agents. And you can see on the bottom right that they were able to quickly get, I think 11,000 patients on trial in a month, month and a half. We couldn't get that on to legitimate trials in an incredibly long time. I don't think we've gotten 11,000 patients on a trial in the US yet. Uh, and they were able to do that in, in, the, in the first weeks of the pandemic. You can also see that these spikes for obvious reasons uh, directly reflected the spikes in the disease that we're seeing and, and how COVID evolved. They've recently gone international. Oh, that's only been in the last two weeks uh, or so. They, but, what they were able to do is when you look at the, the questions we all had, this trial, this one group, this one trial answered all of them. Uh, they showed that azithromycin didn't work. They showed that convalescent plasma didn't work. They showed that dexamethasone did, and they were the first ones to show that. They showed that hydroxychloroquine and, and the, the combination of lopinavir and ritinavir didn't work. And they recently showed a week or two ago that tocilizumab did. Uh, and these are the curves, you know, the survival curves they were able to show that you know, on the bottom left that the first three have no separation and there's, if anything, uh, it might be inferior if you're on hydroxychloroquine at times, uh, but that, that dexamethasone for those uh, requiring oxygen or on a ventilator clear, had clear separation of curves. So again, this idea that if you can put infrastructure that's lightweight, easily scalable and ready to go when you need it, you can actually answer questions at scale incredibly quickly. And they've done, they've done a phenomenal job of that. Uh, and Martin Landry, who is the head of the recovery project, has been on every webinar in the world and has been, you know, requested to talk everywhere, uh, you know, almost like he solved, you know, the most complex disease there is. But in reality, it was just about really intelligent infrastructure and preparing that infrastructure to run things that need to be run. We've tried to come back and do that here in the U.S. So uh, the, there have been three studies sort of selected much more recently. Uh, to, to drive that. One is called REMAP, which was a community-acquired pneumonia uh, platform trial that was out of UPMC. Uh, one is iSpy, which was a breast cancer trial, again, that's out of uh, UCSF, and active one through five, although about to be active six, uh, about to be a sixth of the active trials um, is out of the NIH. And so what you can see is they've started to put more and more trial, more and more sites uh, live. This was as of January. Uh, they've actually been able to put quite a few patients on some of these, a couple thousand patients on some of these, which again is incredibly exciting. We should have been ready to do this a long time ago. Uh, we didn't, but now they're really answering questions. So active is some inpatient, some outpatient. Active six will be fully outpatient. Uh, iSpy is ICU COVID patients where they have a number of arms and they're quickly testing new drugs out of pharma, uh, out of, spawn, out of the uh, industry. Uh, and remap similarly is all comers in, in hospitals and, and how do they put these these things in place. You know, a signal path is our company. We're really focused on the operational uh, technology footprint of these health systems. So we go into enterprise health systems and we become the operational infrastructure on which they run their trials. Uh, and we have some of the really big uh, networks in the country on the platform. And so uh, it was interesting because for a number of these trials, they first went to all the big academic centers and the academic center said, we're inundated, we're inundated with trials. We don't have any patients left to put on anything, right? We can hardly accrue to all of our investigator initiated trials. They came to us and they said, can you get some of the really big health systems that you work with on the, 
on the um, on the platform. I mean, to the point that we were presented, we went from you know nobody at the FDA having heard of us to uh, Operation Warp Speed discussion. So it was an interesting um, sort of experience for us. Uh, and yet, even when it was moving forward, it was still incredibly complex to get these health systems to join, just because we weren't prepared for it. These groups didn't have, it was, there were so many, we can get into from a hackathon an idea, there are many ways to solve this and many ways to get around it, but we just were not prepared from clinical research perspective. Like many things, it was profit driven, which meant it was largely industry driven. It wasn't about how do you put the infrastructure to make these things plug and play. Um, well, and so I was gonna talk, this is some of the stuff that, that we think about in terms of how do you identify sites and feasibility. For the sake of time, I don't need to go too deep in the weeds of this, other than to say, these things are inherently solvable. Uh, we need to, my hope is that coming out of the pandemic, instead of um, just going back to the old model, I, I mean, we saw groups launching trials in four days, which normally they would say they couldn't open a new trial in two months. We saw people that were using video visits and using technology when they couldn't bring people into the clinic to continue the tr moving the trials forward and the FDA's openness to novel approaches and novel ideas. Um, we saw a coordination that was, I mean, even we're seeing different manufacturers make vaccines for others, right? Things that we never would have imagined happening. And my hope is that, you know, you hope some good things come from the experience of the last year. And one of those is that the world really, the U.S. really takes a step back and says, um, clinical trials can't just be a for-profit business. It can't just be about who's going to pay me the most and pay me enough to open their trial uh, and put my patients on their trial and, and really becomes about um, how do we build a reusable infrastructure that makes it a seamless experience. It makes it high margin for sites because they don't have to think about it. There's an exciting drug, an exciting opportunity. It's easy to recruit a patient to it. You're not sitting there for five hours like I was. Uh, we use the data infrastructure and the rest that already exists, the iPhones in people's pockets, the Fitbits on their arms, uh, to be able to answer the questions at scale. The infrastructure exists. It's just about, I think, inertia and overcoming that inertia to drive change. Um, I guess that's all I, I really, uh, thanks for listening to my rambling about, about my experience over the last year. Uh, happy to answer any questions that folks have or, or any questions you have, Hubert. Thank you, thanks, Brad. Uh, no, that was, that was amazing. It's definitely uh, interesting to see all the different directions it took and I had no idea really that there was that much activity especially of uh, non-sponsored trials so pretty pretty cool interesting and uh, thanks for sharing all the insights uh, the personal ones as well because <laughs> they count too and uh, I certainly could hardly sit still when I got my vaccination seeing all the inefficiencies just in the delivery I was timing I was in the carpool line there for my COVID vaccine timing them and thinking, wait a second, we got six lines going, it takes them six minutes to administer them. Why, if I'm in the line for two hours, there's absolutely no reasonable insane explanation why that's happening. Can you have two hours to run my credentials? I just be poke in, out, wait 15 minutes. Next, I couldn't believe what I was seeing. So, and then that was, it was actually worse on the second try. Uh, this was the Parkland site than on my first. Uh, anyway, I just kept seeing stuff like this and, 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 and just wanting to just jump out of my car and start redirecting traffic or figuring out why stuff's going on. So I, I love that about you and what you just shared with us on all the different uh, um, observations you had throughout. Yeah, I, uh, I chair the Parkland Foundation board and it's been interesting watching them try to scale. Uh, they gave 4,000 shots for the first time in one day last Monday, and to be able to get through 4,000 shots is quite the operational infrastructure. So I have a lot of respect of the complexity of, of, of what they've done. Um, it, is, it is quite a task. Well, we're, we're open for questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen. So anyone that wants to ask a question, you can write it in the chat uh, or maybe raise your hand since you have your cameras on. I encourage you to turn your cameras on. Uh, we are all for pajamas, and uh, so don't don't be shy. And and also as a process here, we like to see each other's faces. We're going to be working on this, uh, hacking away the next few days. So um, don't be shy. Um, see if anybody has a question in the chat, or just raise your hand, either the virtual hand or the real hand, uh, to ask a question or bring up a topic. Uh, we have another 20 minutes or so to discuss. So Bill is asking, um, 
Bill, that's directed to me, but you're okay with me asking that question, right? I'm assuming yes. Okay, good. How much of a delay in vaccinating is due to legal liability avoidance rather than for true clinical reasons? So um, I don't know if you have a, a good answer for that one, Brad. Uh, delay in vaccination, meaning the delay to get it to market or? Well, I, I well, I, I, Bill, feel free to chime in here. Uh, you can unmute yourself and uh, clarify. So the, the question says how much, yeah, go ahead. Oh, okay. So he can't, he can't speak this moment. So the question exact, you know, how much of a delay in vaccination is due to legal avoidance, general, uh, general concept. So I, I suppose that bringing them to market. And yeah. So, I mean, I think that the way that they did the trial made a ton of sense in that it's about two months to figure out, you need two months from the second shot to know if it works or not, or sorry, if there are side effects or not. Um, so I actually think that it is uh, pretty legitimate to say that we need to put it in 40 or 50,000 people. We need to wait two months for those folks like myself and make sure that nothing goes awry because as soon as you flip the switch and you're starting to mass vaccinate, and you have millions of people getting this in a given day. If something is, is if there's a signal that's strong enough, if, it, if it's not seen in 40 or 50,000 people that are being watched closely, chances are it's gonna be small enough that you haven't caused irreparable harm. But uh, you need those kind of scale. I think you absolutely need that kind of scale to answer that question. I think that in my view, Pfizer, in my experience for Pfizer for me, but Moderna and everybody else, has actually done a really good job of striking a balance, even how they unblinded people that were on the trial. So I knew I got the vaccine because I, my arm hurt like crazy and I felt exhausted. So uh, either I really had a placebo effect that was pretty remarkable or I, or I was on the, on the thing. Uh, I might or might not have also checked my antibodies. So I also knew I had converted. So on multiple levels, I knew I wasn't on the placebo, but um, you know, the, the, the reality is that I think that they, they started on blinding people as soon as you were part one or part, you know, one A or one B, they would unblind you and they had a process. I think that they did an incredible job of striking the right balance of, uh, of, of what it should look like to deter that trial. Right. Okay. Well, let's, uh, let's, let's switch over to Patrick and, and anyone that has a question, uh, write the question out to everyone. Uh, so, so that, that way Brad can see it as well. Uh, and uh, it'll be a little easier. So Patrick, wait a second, did we just, yeah, there you are. Yeah, so I'm just kind of curious. We've, I've been part of our vaccination site in Garland at the uh, football stadium. And one of these that's been coming up a lot is this sort of self-report idea because we have this giant field experiment with millions of patients across the, you know, across the globe, now millions of vaccinated patients. How is that impacting the ability to kind of reevaluate things when you have so many folks that, potentially could report side effects, but so many of them that are not. I know for me personally, a lot of our folks that I've vaccinated for the police department have reported side effects, but it sort of stays internally. And it's kind of shocked me that how hard it is to get that information back into the system. Is that something that you think is solvable? So I forget the name of the tool they used. Uh, the woman who was my mentor of many years is the number two at the FDA. And she was spending a lot of time, I forget the name of it. Oracle put together something that was supposed to be everybody was supposed to log their, their side effects and if they had negative outcomes and, and it's just failed. Uh, you know, I think it was a lack of coordination on a national level early on when we started to roll these things out that's been very difficult to overcome. I think it's a travesty that we don't have better information. Uh, there are some vaccine sites like Verily has been running, I, don't, I forget, like 150, that's Google's Life Sciences Group has been running like 150 vaccine sites and they've been collecting quite a bit of data. So there are some out there that I think are doing a good job of, of collecting that data, um, but it's, uh, it's incredibly unfortunate that we haven't done a better job of it to make sure that, um, uh, that, that things aren't, or that things aren't, that we could be missing things that we need to know and, and we won't know any time in the near, near term. Uh, what I can say though, is that the, the, if you look at the early trials, I had seen the phase one data before I got my vaccine and it was pretty obvious that I was going to look just that I was experiencing exactly what they experienced. You know, 20, 30 percent of people, uh, especially after the second shot, are going to feel bad. It's much more common in the younger population of the 40s to 60s versus the 60 plus. Uh, the elderly, for whatever reason, well, because of uh, sort of immune, immune changes as one ages, uh, don't have uh, nearly the same symptom profile. Uh, but most, despite the, the, the inadequacy of the follow-up that we have, um, I don't think that there's very little sign that we're missing something that, that's really happening at any scale. Oh, sort of, I don't know if that answered your question, but. Uh... It did, thank you very much. 
All right, we have a couple of questions here. Let's let's go with Bistra first. And, and Brad, I think you can see the question here. In the past few months, there's a strong discussion about vaccination hesitancy. Would you mind discussing the hesitancy in relation to having not having coordinated infrastructure? Yeah, it, um, it's been interesting to see. So even at some of the health systems, one that I'm involved in, they, uh, they said that they had a very hard time initially getting past 60% of the staff that could be vaccinated, getting vaccinated. Uh, they saw 90 plus, 95 plus percent of doctors and uh, nurses and uh, PAs and MPs and residents were willing to get it. I mean, there, there, was, there was incredible uptake in those groups, but a lot of the housekeeping staff and others were below 50%. They were just adamant that they were not going to get it, despite the fact that it was readily available and they could be the first group to get it. Um, they, they said that they had a town hall recently where they had a couple hundred women that were of childbearing age that showed up because that was another group that was uh, was getting information that, that they could that their fertil fertility would be impacted by vaccination. Um, and the problem is that it's incredibly difficult to overcome that, right? Unless you have a deep faith in the medical ed enterprise, which certain communities do not for very good reason. Um, you know, for history of being exper that experiments that have occurred and other things, there, there's a lot of real reason for it. Um, unfortunately, it's been, uh, I think coordinated infrastructure would help. But I also think we need a national campaign that people can really understand. So Parkland, for instance, has taken out ads and radio time and a whole bunch of stuff recently for certain communities, uh, particularly in the Black and Hispanic communities in Dallas. Um, there's, uh, there, there's So some of the early folks that were trying to scale testing in Dallas uh, had a lot of success by going to communities in South Dallas and elsewhere, engaging pastors and engaging community leaders. So I, I think you have to figure out ways to really um, I don't think there, there's, the, there's the utility of a coordinated infrastructure, but there's also knowing the nuance of your community and understanding um, how to really uh, get trusted individuals to have the right conversations and the right ways to deliver them. And I think we've learned a lot about that. Um, unfortunately, as a community, as, a, as opposed to as a nation, I think it's going community by community. But say, so for instance, the group at this hospital, I think they've been able to get from about 60% to 70 to 80% vaccination. Um, over the last couple of months, having seen where it started and, and really come up with a plan how to scale it. Uh, you know, another example is Parkland. Parkland giving vaccines is seen as a, a trustworthy organization and they can have success being the ones to administer it. So there's, I, I think that there's an incredible amount of nuance that's lost in some of the national conversation. And, and I, I, don't, I don't second that because uh, it's been, my, my standard answer has always been, if you're worried about the vaccine, you should not worry about the vaccine because if the vaccine kills people or does terrible things to people, we're in a whole lot more trouble because all doctors across the nation have been vaccinated and there will be no medical help and all nurses. We're in so much trouble. It's not even funny, but I, I guess that was my exhibit A on like, you really think that the people that know most about it would go do have this done to themselves if they thought there was significant danger of any kind. So that's been my, at least in my mind, my most powerful argument, but um, uh, the, the other thing that you just brought up, Brad, is, is a big topic too, because to my, I guess, uh, chagrin, I just heard this morning, I think, uh, that um, already the new one-dose vaccine has been put into a bad light uh, because it is being handed out at, um, at the federal side. And so some people have spun that into saying that the bad vaccine goes to the underprivileged population. And I was just listening to this, holding my head, thinking, oh my gosh, no, please, don't, don't, don't. I mean, anyway, but I, I couldn't believe that that was actually being verbalized by someone, literally thinking that this is what, what is being done. But, but those topics are big, big topics, and um, they have real impact, as you just uh, demonstrated. There's a couple of questions, Brad, uh, in the chat over here. I don't want to ignore Lance's. Uh, Lance, yours was um, a macroeconomic question where the lockdown is the right answer and are the vaccine the greatest thing we've ever seen in science? Um, philosophical question there from Lance. Uh, I'll give you my two, I'll give my thought and then Hubert, you can too. You know, uh, so. Well, so first, I think that some of the recent data over the last couple of days has shown that the macroeconomic impact is not nearly as big as some people thought, um, that it would be, you know, it's on the, I don't want to get into the politics behind it because I don't have a, I'm, I'm, I'm not far in either direction, and nor do I want to weigh it in one direction or another. Um, I would argue that there should have been more nuance regardless, right? So we knew, we know more then and we know more now than 
unfortunately we're putting into practice, whether that's school reopening, restaurant reopening, whatever it is. I think we have knee jerks that are too far in either direction. And, and I think that much like the, the hesitancy question, I think there's a lot of nuance. And if we were in a society that embraced nuance, I think we could come up with much better answers than we have in, in both directions would be my first answer. And my second is uh, on the, or the second, the vaccine question to me, uh, um, I think it's one of the greatest things we've done because of the impact it had. I'm not the, the, the role of mRNA is, you know, a decade ago, we couldn't have done it because of the impact of, of mRNA on the body and the way that they were able to deliver it. So there's incredible scientific advancement. There's also been incredible work to understand the, the spike protein that was able to be used here, the incredible ability to decode in a couple of weeks. Uh, the virus and, and be able to build it. So I think in numerous directions, it's it's incredible because of the impact on the population and the lives that it has saved and will have saved. Um, but you know, I don't know. I don't know in reference to other things like the, the polio and everything else. I don't know that I can I can give it in, in relevance to others other than say it's been amazingly powerful. Yeah, I'll I'll uh, since we're on the big picture, I will say this too because you you brought up the UK and their execution as a as a as a good example on. Uh, I guess on on some efforts. So as you know, I'm I'm quite well connected into Europe, and I see uh, some things firsthand through my friends uh, over there. And um, you know, my expectation of a national nationalized healthcare system, like in Austria, where I have pretty good insight, uh, would be that they should be able to execute. Like, I mean, they should blow us away right this moment. This should be. This should be the moment when they shine. They've got information about every single citizen in the country. They've got health ID cards. They've got a nationalized system. They can organize in a way that puts us to, should put us to shame. But I can report and tell you that it ain't so. I mean, my own parents are in their 80s and they're just, just now barely getting access. I mean, they're, they've now been invited to get a vaccine. And um, that is, I mean, they're way, way, way behind us. And that should not be the case if that is the solution. So I, I, I always mention these things because I see them first, firsthand. And I've been in the medical system over in Europe too. So whenever you think one single solution solves everything, uh, be careful with what you wish for. And uh, again, this is, not a, this is not a political statement, but I just want to point out that this should be the moment when we see these systems absolutely shine. Now, in Israel, that's a good good example there. I think there's a lot more at play than just the nationalized system, but uh, you're going to always find one or two outliers that outperform despite or because of the system, but generally I'll be... So I, I'd be curious on your observations on that because Europe should, should uh, uh, by all means, be uh, way ahead of us with the tools they have at their disposal. And, and I, don't, can, I can't explain why that's not happening, except that I don't necessarily believe in handing everything over to the state. And Kevin, I'll, I'll, I actually do know the answer to that one. So the, uh, the BARDA has given a $65 million grant to a group called Quantum Health that's behind iSpy. So the same group, I think it is, BARDA has been an enormous supporter of it in the DOD. Uh, to, to scale out the, the iSpy and Quantum Health Network to, to get these platform trials in place. I don't know specifically, it's the same part of BARDA that was the Distributed Synthetic Chemistry Program, but um, they have been the one driving it. And initially I was a little surprised it was coming out of the DOD. So uh, it was, uh, didn't make sense until I, I, I learned some of the background of the infrastructure they were to build. But uh, if you wanna see their funding, look at the, look at the Quantum Health Corroborate of the $66.5 million grant that they gave them in, in December to scale these trials. A question from Jawar. Yeah, hi, uh, Dr. Hirsch. Thank you so much for sharing um, uh, your journey. Uh, I'm just fascinated by the pandemic research network, which um, you kind of mentioned. Um, I mean, I'm a, a neonatal intensivist, um, and um, in the NICU population, we have a neonatal research network. It comprises of like an you know, outlaw, like 20 or 30 sites. And whenever there is a trial, it goes across all the sites. Um, and uh, so my question I have is, um, so um, uh, do you get any support from the, uh, from the NIH or something for this network? And is it, does it um, become like a template for uh, in future if you have another pandemic um, where you can replicate um, the trials and um, um, uh, with, with this, with this uh, network? 
Yeah, so absolutely. So um, the goal, so first of all, it, it, the beauty of it would be that if we get it right, not we as SignalPad, but we as the country get it right, it's just as useful for dentistry and ophthalmology and neurology and cardiology as it is for a pandemic. Because what we really need is a quick way to test drugs at scale, whether they're, you know, even reuse of established, established therapeutics. Um, and so I think where the government will go, I think where the FDA, the NIH and others will go is actually putting more and more money behind this, much like this DOD grant that I just referenced um, to really build reusable infrastructure for the future. Uh, I really, really, truly hope that that's the outcome. I don't care if signal that's a core part of it or not. I mean, I'd hope we are, but you know, even quantum health works deeply with groups like Salesforce and others of how do you think of data infrastructure to pull it off? Because a big part of the UK success was not just the, the uh, operational infrastructure, it was the data infrastructure to do it too. Um, and it, it seems like an easy thing to use EHR data out of our electronic health records or dentistry records or whatever uh, to put them directly into a clinical trial. It's actually incredibly complex. You need to know the provenance of the data and you need to understand how it gets mapped. And you need to, there, there's so many pieces to that. It's all doable, right? It's all, it's just about having the focus and the money and, and, and you know, the, the ability to do it. So, um, uh, yeah, I, I, ho I hope that is our goal as, as well as the goal of many others. We're so focused on telehealth and things that uh, there, I, I think that there are bigger things we need to solve. Thank you. Well, let's see if there's any last question maybe. And um, I'm scrolling through you to see if we skipped anything that was asked. Um, well, well let's, let's do it this way. We, we will jump over to Discord for those of you who have um, uh, registered already. Uh, you have your Discord link. If you don't know what that is, then and you haven't signed up for the Texas Healthcare Challenge and what Brad told you about ex excites you and uh, you want to know more about it, go to texashealthcarechallenge.com and you'll find a button to push and to link up and, and then your, your uh, application will be uh, quickly reviewed and we'll put you in the queue. We've got over 100 people signed up. Uh, I'm not, I'm, I'm not sure how many, but I, I know we have a few spots still left. Um, but it's pre pretty full. So uh, yeah, there, Lindsay just put the, the, the uh, URL into the chat. So consider that maybe no matter what your background is. And uh, for those of you who are signed up, uh, you have gotten information on the Discord platform, which we would invite you now to jump over to and uh, communicate and orient yourself with regards to it, get to know it, go to the welcome room first. We'll have a couple of uh, directors and mentors there that can welcome you and show you around a little bit and, um, and, and, and get, you, get you onboarded so that you're ready for, uh, for Friday and Saturday. Uh, Brad, I want to leave the last word to you. First of all, uh, thank you so much for donating your time and, uh, and, and sharing all this information with everyone here. It's inspiring and, and, and we just couldn't have done it. We would have not known the things and the insights that you have are incredible. And I hope that people will uh, hack on the, on the COVID innovation channel and come up with some cool stuff and maybe then be able to call you and say, hey, got something cool here, maybe we can collaborate. But last word. Yeah, no, I, uh, I, love, I love what you're trying to do and what you're doing and excited about the hackathon. And if I have any really cool ideas, unfortunately I have a meeting that morning or else I would absolutely be there in person. And if there are cool ideas in the clinical research world that I can help with, I would love to. So uh, I uh, continue to engage with the health wildcatters and others because I think that it's stuff that moves the needle and, and hopefully leads us to a better place. So thanks for having, letting me take part.